Professor Craig Burnett in the Department of Political Science here at Hofstra University. Welcome to Hofstra University for the Nassau County Executive Committee. I'd like to express thanks for a couple of organizations and individuals uh, before we get underway here. First, thanks to the League of Women Voters of both Nassau and Suffolk Counties for putting this together and organizing it and really helping this uh, get into action and underway today. Um, also, would like to thank the candidates and for their candidate responses tonight, our student volunteers, who without them, well, this whole thing wouldn't happen because they are our manpower. Uh, University Relations for also helping coordinate this. The staff at Hofstra who came in on a Sunday to help pull this off and have done an excellent job. And then, of course, Pride Productions, who is, uh, they are actually live streaming this as well. So if you know people at home who could not actually get here today, they can easily pull it up on our website and, and stream it uh, in, instead of actually being here. Uh, now, uh, with all those thanks, I would like to turn over the podium to Nancy Rosenthal, who is the current president of the Nassau County League of Women Voters. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome to all. Uh, could we all stand please and say the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Thank you. I'm now just going to briefly uh, run through, uh, you know, mechanical kinds of things. Please be certain your cell phones are off. If you need to speak on your cell phone, please leave the room. If there is no videotaping and no picture taking, the candidates have all agreed to this, so we uh, ask that the audience abide by it as well. Um, and everything is being live streamed right now and is also on the Hofstra radio. So uh, that's all covered. Um, the, the moderator is from Suffolk County, so has no vested interest in this campaign. The candidates have drawn lots and uh, for f who goes first and who goes last at the end. Uh, the questions which you can ask, there are note cards being passed around by the Hofstra volunteers. Um, be certain that they are issues with the campaign um, those questions are being vetted by Hofstra and the League of Women Voters in the back there so that uh, to avoid duplication and uh, in case anything is maybe uh, defamatory or of a personal contact uh, conflict. Um, candidates will have uh, two minutes for opening. Uh, they will also have a minute and a half to answer question, the questions and two minutes to close. Um, they will also have a red card, so perhaps they want to rebut. Uh, they get, thank you. They uh, have three, they have three uh, possibilities to rebut uh, on, a, on a question. Um, Michelle Lamberti, right here, can you stand up, Michelle? Uh, she is going to be our timekeeper. Uh, I think that's it. I think we covered all of that. I wanted to tell you two things. One, uh, probably more than two things. One, there's vote 411, which all of these candidates, and I will tell you all 115 candidates in Nassau County, have filled out a questionnaire. Uh, so they will be online, vote 411. You put in your zip code. There's a flyer on it out back. Everybody that's in your particular district comes up and uh, you'll get a pro and con voter's guide. It's the League of Women Voters uh, voter's Guide. And uh, I appreciate all the candidates that uh, fill that out. And we run a very high percentage rate up in the uh, above 95%. So that's really terrific. Um, there are three ballot questions on the ballot this year. Uh, so the main concern is be certain you turn your ballot over because the propositions are on the back side. You can go on LWV uh, ny.org and the uh, if you go to voter guide part two uh, you can get a full detailed pro and con of the uh, ballot issues that are that are on there the three ballot issues so i think that's it without further ado i turn this over now to lisa scott who is the president of the league of women voters of suffolk county who will be our moderator today 
We will be concluding by 5.30, just so everybody knows. That's our time frame. Okay, at this point, I'm going to welcome the candidates, and I hope you applaud all three of them. Okay? So, Cassandra, <laughs> Laura, Thank you. Okay, and Jackie, welcome. Okay, um, a reminder about the questions that uh, I usually juggle about 50 cards. I try to keep the questions grouped in topics because the reason the league does these debates is to educate, not only you in the room, because I think a lot of you actually are already educated on the issues, but also for the people, the students with the radio, the live streaming, um, the League will, I think, post the link on YouTube ultimately for the full debate, so it'll be a record for a lot of people. In the, uh, with the goal of educating everyone, the questions become important. Most of us, myself included, if you have an opportunity to ask a question, you put it in a context and you make a bit of a statement and then you ask your question. Don't do that. Get right to the question. You need a couple of words in there, but we want their voices to be heard, not mine asking them at great length, as I am right now, but also succinct and to the point. And again, we want to cover a variety of issues, and, um, and it's all in the benefit here. Also, civility matters. We uh, see this forum as one that is above the fray, is a real exchange of ideas. Uh, I ask that the questions be uh, civilized and to the point and also that the candidates attempt to stick to the subject. Every once in a while, I think I've moderated most of you at some point, I'll say, wait a minute, you know, like nobody answered the question I just asked. I'll try not to do that because I think it's important you hear the candidates, but it is important to get to what these people in the audience really want to hear. Um, also, once they do their opening statement, please applaud each candidate at the end of their statement. After that, no applause till the very end. Uh, again, some of you have seen me moderate. I will stop and we will wait until any applause, any responsive outbursts stop. Really try hard, okay? So um, without further ado then, um, I believe Mr. Martins, you are making the first two minute opening statement. Thank you, thank you all very much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for the forum once again, uh, providing an opportunity for candidates to express themselves, share their ideas, and giving the voters a choice and an opportunity to hear differing opinions. I want to thank Laura and Cassandra for joining us in this forum as well. Looking forward to a great debate. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jack Martins. I am uh, married for 22 years. My wife and I are raising our four daughters, uh, business owner and uh, former mayor of Mineola, former state senator, looking forward to um, addressing some of the issues facing Nassau County. You know, as I went around the county these past three, three and a half months, and we've held nearly eight forums, town halls in different parts of the county, uh, the themes that come through are pretty, pretty standard. People are concerned about finances here in the county, high taxes, an assessment system that, frankly, they can't trust, crumbling infrastructure and the need to reinvest in that infrastructure, protecting the environment, water quality, and certainly drinking water and surface water being primary concerns, issues that deal with the future of our county because we all want the same thing. We live here because we choose to live here and we want our children to have the same opportunities we have to live here in Nassau County to find jobs and good paying jobs and to be able to raise their families in the great communities that we grew up in. So whomever gets elected on January 1st, the reality is this, those challenges are going to be there. And so I put my name forth because of the experience I have, not only as a small business owner, but also as someone who tackled some of these same issues as a mayor, as a state senator dealing with these issues regionally, and certainly someone who understands the deep challenges facing our county. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kern, two Thank minutes. You. 
I am not a career politician. I actually got into public service through my kids. I have a background as a newspaper reporter, and I wanted to do what I could to help my kids and my community succeed. So I had the opportunity to run for school board. And as a school board member, I loved dealing with the budget, I loved dealing with the policy, and I just loved being engaged with my community in that sort of granular way. And it really sparked my interest to step up and serve my community in a bigger way. I had the opportunity to run for county legislator. And as a legislator for the past almost four years, I'm very proud of the reputation as someone who puts her constituents first and also works across party lines to get stuff done. However, I don't want to sugarcoat it. For the past four years, I've had a front row seat to the corruption, to the mismanagement, and to the dysfunction. And as I travel around the county and I talk to people in whatever community it is, whatever the demographics are, whatever the politics are, there's a common denominator, and that is a feeling of deep distrust. And it's no wonder. I mean, you don't have to be a legislator to know what I'm talking about. When you pick up the paper, you turn on the news, and you see elected officials, Skelos, Mangano, Venditto, being carted off in handcuffs, it's no wonder people are not trusting the government. The system is broken. I'm running for county executive because I believe we truly deserve a government that lives up to us. We work hard. Your neighbors work hard, you work hard, you pay high taxes. You deserve a government that lives up to you. I'm running because I have the experience and the independence to do what, ta what it takes to turn this county around and make the government finally accountable to the taxpayers. Okay, and two minutes, Ms. Lems. Good afternoon. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event and most especially for inviting me to participate. This is not just a pro forma thank you. The League of Women Voters is one of the very few organizations that always invites all of the candidates, including third party candidates. Green party candidates are routinely ignored by the press, excluded from most candidates' forums. For instance, in, there, in two weeks, there's a Nassau County Executive Environmental Candidate Forum. When we first heard about this event, we got in touch with the organizers and asked to be included. After all, the Green Party, the environment, no-brainer, right? Well, we were told that the Green Party candidates are not viable because we don't get the large campaign contributions that the big party candidates do. The organizers of that forum are only interested in candidates they think have enough money to win, not necessarily the candidate who will truly fight for the environment. Now, I'm not bringing this up just to throw shade on that other candidate's forum. I bring it up as just one small example of how elections are all about money. My opponent's campaign literature says that the system isn't working. What they don't seem to realize is that they are part of that system. The other two candidates were each chosen by a two-piston political machine that has been running the government on Long Island for decades. And they have both accepted huge amounts of money from developers, special interests, and from the big parties, which are, of course, special interests in their own right. I'm not accusing my opponents of corruption, but they're part of the system that corrupts. Things are not going to improve in this county until we make a radical change. I have some fresh new ideas, and I welcome the chance to tell you about them today. Okay, thank you all for your intros. Um, at this point, what we do is, um, I have a crib sheet here, and we'll start the first question with Ms. Curran, because she was second, and we'll go around. So I'll keep track of that. Each of you will get one and a half minutes, Max, and I will have to ask you to stop at the end of your phrase. Please don't go on, because I will have to interrupt, and I don't like doing that. Um, if there is a question, and you've already answered it, and you feel that something one of your um, opponents said <coughs> it, you need to respond to, that's what the red card's about. You get an additional 30 seconds, but you only get to use it three times in the full debate. So uh, the question I'd like to ask from the audience is, <coughs> I'm sorry, 
In your opinion, what is the most important issue confronting Nassau County, and how would you explain why you think it is that most important issue? Ms. Kern? Thank one and you a half. very much. I really do believe it's, it's beginning to restore trust in government. I mean, if we want to create a vision of how we grow and how we do true economic development, we have got to be trustworthy. Uh, the other issue that I think is incredibly important is getting our finances in order. Uh, and one way to do that is make sure that we grow the tax base. I mean, people might not realize this, but 40% of our revenue in the county comes from sales tax. So we've got to do everything we can to make business viable, to attract business. We've got to make our IDA more muscular so that we get great deals and good investment for taxpayer money. We've got to be really serious about transit-oriented development, creating a wide range of housing options, walkable downtowns. But before we can do that, we, you know, because that involves working across party lines, it involves working across municipal lines, it includes working with our partners in the state and federal government. Before we have any credibility in doing that, we have got to restore the trust and put safeguards in order in, 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 right in our government to stop corruption before it starts. Thank you. Uh, we will now pause. Please, no applause, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Martins, a minute and a half on that question, please. Sure. The, the primary issue is restoring public trust in government. Um, you know, obviously, after watching elected official after elected official arrested, indicted uh, for every Mangano, Vendido, Ippolito, there was a Denenberg, Solages, Corbin, Williams, and Terry. And I think it's important that we understand that before we celebrate one side or the other being more corrupt, we understand that unfortunately, and it's not something we should celebrate, both sides have a lot to be ashamed about when it comes to public corruption in Nassau County. And I think we should all understand that as well. Fixing the county's finances is certainly 1A right after one, fixing the assessment system, making sure that we get rid of knife of the understanding that we have 17 years under an oversight board, under Democrats and Republicans during those 17 years, and haven't been able to structurally fix our budget in a way that allows us to make the kinds of investments in infrastructure and the kinds of investments in our economy going forward is critically important. And so who we are as a county, our ability to fix our own problems and not leave those problems for our children is important. That's our responsibility, and that's my commitment. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lund? I think the other candidates in most of the races actually in Nassau County think that corruption is the number one issue, and it's very important. We need to restore trust in the government. I think the taxpayers think that the most important issue is the cost of living and high taxes and balancing the budget. But I personally think the most important issue that we need to keep in mind is to protect our island, to protect our planet from global warming, from intrusion of chemicals and salt water into our aquifers. Uh, we need to stop dumping chemicals and fertilizers into the ocean and the bay. We're going to kill our planet. I think it's very short-sighted just to focus on the corruption and balancing the budget, which are also important, and I do have some ideas about those. But I, as the Green Party candidate, have to stress that we can't do enough to protect our, the, play, the only planet we have to live on. Okay, thank you. There are quite a few questions that are coming in from the audience that deal with, in general, what I'll call financial issues. So I'm trying to group these, and I have a few more now to get to them. So at this point, um, I've gotten myself slightly out of order, but we'll go Ms. Lenz, we'll go Mr. Martins, and then Ms. Curran, okay? So this question is, what is your view of the privatization of county services, water, sewer, buses, and so forth? Privatization is evil incarnate. I have more to say on the subject. It's a quick fix for the government to privatize. They get rid of the cost 
they pass it along to the taxpayers who have to pay for it privately. Look what happened to the bus service after we privatized it. They cut services, they keep coming back for more money. What, what happens when you turn water over to private companies? There are people paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for water every month now because their little area was privatized, their little water district was privatized. I would fight tooth and nail the privatization of the sewer system. I hate to think what's gonna happen with that. Um, the problem with privatization is that you're turning functions over from a nonprofit government that's supposed to be focusing on the individuals that live in the district, and you're turning them over to for-profit corporations. Where are they gonna get those profits? From the taxpayers that one way or another, and it's gonna cost more because they're for profit. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martins, same question. Thank you. Um, I oppose privatization. I think that we have to understand that there are basic functions that county government has to provide. So whether it's water, sewer, whether it's police coverage and public safety, whether it's ambulance service, and whether it's bus service, um, government should not be transferring those responsibilities to others. We've seen what the effects are of those. Um, certainly, there are additional costs, and if there is money up front, that money is short-lived, and we see that the consequences over time is that it actually becomes more expensive as you add a profit component. There's a proposal that we should privatize ambulance service, and, and frankly, I think it's, it's absurd. The idea that from a public safety standpoint that we're going to rely on the private sector who are gonna take their direction from whomever has um, oversight over that ambulance service. We saw what happened during Sandy when ambulances were pulled off of Long Beach and directed to New York City and away from our communities because there was a private sector provider there. We have a responsibility to provide government and government has to provide or provide services and government has to provide those services that are essential. So whether it's water, whether it's sewer, whether it's ambulance, or whether it's bus, I will just contextualize that 20 years ago, our county was spending $20 million, over $20 million on bus service. Today they spend six. And yet we complain each and every year that we're gonna cut back on bus service, affecting those who are most critically impacted and have no other way of getting to work or to school or to the medical appointments. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kern? I actually think we have to be a little more flexible in how we do government. Um, if we want to stay efficient and really get into the 21st century, I would not say absolutely not to private-public partnerships, or P3s as they're called in the jargon. Sometimes they make sense. They make sense if they are cost-effective for the taxpayer. They make sense if they provide the services that people expect. However, unfortunately, under this current administration, we've had three big P public-private partnerships. And in all three cases, the deals made have not been delivered on. And I think the most egregious example is the jail. Privatized health care at the jail spent uh, $60 million without the proper oversight that was necessary, that the contract actually dictated. And guess what happened? The Attorney General launched an investigation and we're on the hook in millions of dollars in litigation fees. So when it is correct to privatize, I, I would say let's do it. Let's make sure that we manage that money properly because it is, is taxpayer money. And let's make sure that we get the services that were promised in the first place. That has not happened. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question would start with Mr. Martins. Um, Plans have been around for a few years to cut 2.6 million from hospitals that treat the neediest patients, such as Nassau County Medical Center. What steps would you take to reverse these cuts? You don't, you don't balance the budget on the backs of those who are most in need. I think we've been very clear in the $3 billion budget that we have in Nassau County. The idea that we will go back time and again, and whether it's hospital services, whether it's um, bus services, as I just mentioned in my previous uh, uh, answer, whether it's youth services or senior citizen services, it tends to be um, those areas that are most impactful that are constantly brought up during budget time for cuts. And so in, in the context of a 
$3 billion budget that has about $125 million in overtime each and every year consistently. The idea of finding a couple of million dollars to service those who are most in need is frankly um, not that difficult. With leadership, there's a way of certainly being able to find the couple of million dollars, certainly against the $125 million we have in overtime in this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Curran? So the question is about, is about um, hot, the hospitals and... Yeah, the, the cut... Uh, right. Yeah, I, I, I'm concerned that we ought to, all too often, because there's so little discretionary, it's only 5% of the $3 billion budget that's discretionary, that we are looking, you know, the county often looks to balance the budget on the most vulnerable. I think that's inhuman in that people don't get the services that they expect. I also think it's just bad economic development. When you're cutting services, for example, the youth program, when you're cutting those programs, guess what happens? Kids aren't getting the homework help they need, they're not getting the gang prevention help they need, and then we're going to pay a much further cost down the road. I think it's important to take care of our most vulnerable, not only because it's the right thing to do, it's good for our communities and it's good for our overall county. Thank you. Ms. Lent? The government is supposed to be taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. It would be outrageous to cut services to the most needy in the hospitals. Um, I am working toward whether I, or not I win this election and really not to do with this election, I'm working for passage of the New York Health Act, which would provide universal single payer health care to every citizen of this state, well, to every resident of this state. This would not only guarantee health care to everyone, but it would save the county about half a billion dollars because, or which is about 16% of the county's current budget. The county currently pays about $297 million in medical insurance for its employees and $237 million in Medicaid costs. Those costs would go away with universal health care. This reduction in costs would reduce taxes and provide universal, comprehensive health care to all New Yorkers without premiums, co-pays, deductibles, or limited provider networks. I would like to know if the other ca two candidates support this act. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question will start, uh, let's see, with uh, Ms. Curran. There's a large outcry by all regarding proposed fee hikes. What instead would you propose to streamline the county's budget and balance it? Excellent question. So when it looks, unfortunately, we've, we're, we're facing again at the county uh, pretty high fee hikes, on, mostly on the public safety, public, when you get a ticket for a red light camera or when you get a speeding ticket or something like that, and also mortgage recording and GIS fees having to do with real estate. I'm concerned that this basically is another tax and if you accumulate the amount of money that's going to be raised by these fees, it far exceeds the 2% tax cap. So let's call it what it is. It's a tax. So what do we do to, to balance the budget instead of that? We've got to look at outside billing. We spend millions and millions of dollars on outside contracts that a lot of that work we can bring in-house. And often it's, it's spent on politically connected firms outside of, the, of county government. There's some of that work we can bring in-house. And as I said before, things that are better outsourced, that we do need outside vendors on, let's manage that better. We also have opportunities in this budget for other than personnel services, right? We can also look at our real estate, consolidate the real estate that we have, sell off what we no longer need. We need to do a full inventory of that. And again, of course, grow the tax base. Create a vision for how we grow the tax base to keep our young people and to keep it from eroding. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lent? I agree a lot with a lot of what Laura says, except, of course, that I disagree that we should sell off county property, and I disagree on a few other minor points. But one thing we can do, instead of relying on sales tax, real estate tax, and fees, which are basically regressive taxes, we can institute a county income tax piggybacked to the state income tax. We can sharply reduce the real estate taxes and school taxes so that we're paying something comparable to what people pay in other states, which is a couple of thousand dollars 
on a typical plot of land and house, um, and instead institute a graduated income tax for the county so that the rich are paying their fair share and the poor are paying less. Uh, we can also get rid or at least overhaul the broken and unfair real estate assessment system under the leadership of a professional assessor, which I understand we don't have. Thank you. Mr. Martins? Thank you. You know, I've had the privilege of serving in the New York State Senate for three terms during those three terms from 2010 through 2016. We had the opportunity to pass budgets that were not only on time, balanced, but also cut taxes for, um, frankly, for everyone, for uh, every taxpayer in New York State, corporations, uh, manufacturers, and did more with less. Stayed within the 2% and we were able to make it work. When I was in Mineola, we were able to restructure the finances of the, of, of the village and certainly those challenges are remarkably similar to the challenges facing Nassau County. The opportunity is there. You know, everyone asks, well, where are you going to cut? Where are you going to increase uh, revenues? Folks, we have a $3 billion budget. About $900 million comes from property taxes. About $1.2 comes from sales tax. And the rest of it comes from ancillary fees and the like. We don't have a revenue problem in this county. We have a spending problem in the county. And we haven't been properly managing the county finances over the years. I mentioned just a moment ago that we spend over $125 million a year just in overtime. And overtime isn't the time that you need to work and get things done. That's time that is as a result of poor management. And so just a commitment to cutting overtime in half, which is something I've done in the past when I was in the village, will go a long way towards providing the resources we need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question, continuing on the financial side, we'd start with uh, Ms. Lenz. House Republicans have proposed tax legislation that may include the elimination of state and local tax deductions. Many North Nassau villages oppose it. Where do you stand on this? I would definitely oppose that. I, I don't know who's running this country anymore. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know what we can do about it, frankly. Um, I'm just hoping that the uh, Republicans are as ineffective in enacting this as they have been in enacting anything else this session. Thank you. Um, Mr. Martins, Thank same you. question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, is, it is remarkably short-sighted um, and obviously is directed directly at every homeowner in Nassau County, every homeowner in New York State, the possibility of losing a deduction on our mortgage uh, interest paid on our mortgages, certainly deductions for our property taxes, uh, the impact to our homes and our homeowners here in Nassau County would be devastating, certainly to our property values. And whether you are a Republican, a Democrat, or a member of the Green Party, I think, as long as you are a Nassau County resident, you know full well um, that this is something that we will fight tooth and nail and uh, is something that will not be acceptable to anyone, not only in Nassau County, but anywhere else in New York State. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ms. Curran? Yeah, we've got to work really hard in lobbying our, our Congress people here on Long Island to fight this with everything they've got because it would get rid of the exemption that we already pay on state and local taxes, including our property taxes, which are already astronomically high. So we're getting taxed on something that, we would be, that we're already getting taxed on, which is, it's crazy. It would hurt us terribly as a region. I think people would leave, people, uh, new people wouldn't want to come, and so we've got to really stand up. And this is something that does unite Republicans and Democrats alike because it hits us all very, very hard if this is going to go through. Thank you. Uh, the next question, we start with Mr. Martins. Given the high cost of living in Nassau County, what are your plans to incentivize young working professionals to stay in Nassau? Thank you. You know, I um, had the opportunity when I was uh, mayor of Mineola to deal with this very issue. If you look at Mineola now, uh, most of the transit-oriented development that has been built in Nassau County, not just proposed, but built in the ground, is in downtown Mineola as a result of uh, my efforts when I was mayor to uh, redo our master plan, build the consensus around the greater density, and now you have 
tremendous housing stock in our downtown um, that has led the way for other communities to do the same thing. It comes to providing variety in housing stock, apartments. It also comes with a commitment that we're going to create and need to create an environment that allows those jobs, well-paying jobs, to relocate right here. There are no Fortune 500 companies that are based in Nassau County. There are two in Suffolk, there are three in Westchester, there are 16 in northern Jersey in the eight counties surrounding New York City, zero in Nassau County, and I say it's because we've had an oversight board here for 17 years. We have not been able to make ends meet. We have not been able to invest in our own future. We haven't made the necessary infrastructure investments that would attract those kinds of investments, and it comes down to a job. It comes down to a job. The ability of people to work, raise their families here, and be able to pay the high cost of living that exists in all of the areas I mentioned, but they don't come to Nassau County because we haven't put our best foot forward for so long. It's time we led again. Thank you. Ms. Kern? Yes, transit-oriented development will be what keeps our young people and attracts more young people. We need to create an environment and working with our IDA, making sure that our IDA has people serving on that board, and that's the county executive that appoints them, people serving on that board that are experts in land use, experts in finance, experts in planning, and making sure that when we do a deal, for instance, when we do a deal for housing, using taxpayer money as an investment, right, make sure that there is some level of affordable housing, a good percentage of affordable housing so that we can attract and keep more young people. And let's not forget the transit part of transit-oriented development. I am a firm believer in robust public transportation. I'm very proud that I was an unapologetic advocate for the third track, because frankly, we need more people to get on and off the island that we can, and this will help spur more of a, walk of a walkable downtown in Mineola, Hicksville, and also Westbury. Uh, we look at what's working. It's working in, in Patchogue, out in Suffolk, it's working in Farmingdale here in Nassau, and we need to do everything we can. I'm very proud when we're talking about public transportation to have crafted a bipartisan solution to restore routes to the NICE bus. Unfortunately, under this current administration, they have not made public transportation or the buses a priority. Under my administration, the buses will never be on the chopping block. It's economic development, and it's key to keeping our young people here. Thank you. Ms. Lund? Every new development project in this county should include affordable housing. Nassau County should work with the towns and the cities to try to do away with some of the barriers to innovative housing solutions, such as group housing for young people. Um, I know in my town, town of North Hempstead, there's a very fine line that you can walk to live with people who you're not related to. The rules are, were designed to prevent poor people from being exploited and crowded into housing that they didn't belong in, but it prevents six college students from renting a house together unless they do things exactly right. Um, the other thing is we need we just need to make sure that there's more affordable housing. We need to reduce property taxes so that young people can afford to purchase housing here on Long Island, and we can do that by moving that tax burden to an income tax. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Kern, we're gonna start with you on the next one. What should be done with the property next to Belmont Racetrack? Affordable housing, soccer stadium, Islanders hockey rink, other? Explain. Well, I'm really excited to study the RFP that was just answered this past week. Uh, I, at least three bids came in, and I'm very curious to see what they are. We've read about it in the paper. We know a little bit. Whatever we do there, please, let's not blow it like we blew it at the hub, right? The islanders are gone. Hopefully, we'll do everything we can to bring them back. But right now, we've got a re redone coliseum in 77 acres of parking lot basically because career politicians just got in their own way and nothing got done. But we've got an opportunity there, and back to the question, we've got a real opportunity in Belmont, whether it's the Islanders, whether it's the soccer, whether it's the other plan, whatever it is that's the best fit for the community, let's make sure that we engage the community, engage the community early, get their buy-in, get their input, because that's what will make it a success. This is a, 
a really great opportunity for what we're all talking about, talking about true economic development, whether it's housing, whether it's sports, whether it's some kind of mixed use that encompasses all of these things. Let's not let partisan bickering and municipal bickering get in the way. And it's, as we've learned time and again, it is key to engage the community early, early and often. You can't overdo it. Thank you. Ms. Lambs? Well, since this would be new development, mixed use, I'd like to see the Islanders back on Long Island. I'm not a sports fan, but it's ridiculous that they're not on Long Island. I would like to see um, mixed use, uh, moderate to low income housing mixed into that, along with shopping. And I would like to see transportation that goes there all the time, not just when there's games, so that the people in the neighborhood can use that. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's not good that that property is not being used, and I'd like to see it uh, used as a, a new center for activities of all kinds, housing, uh, shopping, sports, entertainment. Thank you. Mr. Martins? Thank you. You know, the, the Belmont property is a, um, a wonderful opportunity for the county. Uh, if you consider all of the places that we have and open spaces that we have in the county, uh, converting a weed-infested parking lot into something vital is something that we should all be striving for. Um, it is not a Republican or a Democratic issue, but certainly it is a Nassau County issue. Bringing the Islanders back or doing something there will bring sales tax revenue, will bring economic development to a community that, that needs it, will bring revenue and a tax base to those school districts and the surrounding communities around Belmont that frankly also need it. And so if you understand the the demographics and the identity around Belmont um, and a world-class brand that is Belmont's racetrack. The plans that Naira has for Belmont include fixing the grandstand, bringing in a hotel, doing some improvements there, maybe some shops and some restaurants. The idea of fixing that train station, adding about $100 million in improvements there that the Long Island Railroad is being called on to do, putting in an intermodal center that will be able to tie back bus systems to the Long Island Railroad because that area of Nassau does not have an active uh, train station right now and so that would be a vital component and certainly I am unabashedly uh, an Islander fan. I want to see them back here. I want to see the opportunity for them to come back, build the arena and here's the kicker. This is state land. The land is owned by New York State. It is not subject to zoning from, uh, from Hempstead and certainly uh, gives us the opportunity to move quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lems, you start this one. Uh, what are your plans, pro or con, for zombie homes to be cleaned up and placed back on the market for sale, including to land trust organizations? I have not really studied this issue. Um, thankfully, I have lived on the South Shore and I haven't seen many of the zombie homes. Um, I agree that they should be dealt with by the government in some form, but I don't, I don't really have a plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Martins? Thank you. I um, had the opportunity to work with my colleagues when I was in the state senate to pass legislation statewide that dealt with the zombie homes. Certainly we've seen them. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept, zombie homes are those homes that were foreclosed by banks and then allowed to sit there and deteriorate. No one maintained them, no one cut the grass, no one maintained the, the homes themselves, they fell apart, and they became, in many instances, um, a real eyesore under the, worst, the best of circumstances. Under the worst of circumstances, they attracted uh, bad elements into those homes and destroyed entire communities. And so the opportunity to work proactively, uh, to intercede, to either transfer those homes, force the banks to maintain them, and force the banks to put them back on the tax rolls um, where they can be properly maintained and developed is critically important. Um, I am an advocate for those homes being taken over by uh, either the county or the towns. Um, there are land bank opportunities to do that, redevelop them, and use them in a, in a way that is, I think, important, either by putting them back into the community or by allowing them to be used, for example, for veterans housing, for affordable housing, for senior housing. Uh, there are opportunities once we make those investments and take those properties over for us to do so in a meaningful way. And so those challenges that came about as a result of the downturn in the economy uh, back in 2008 still exist today. And unfortunately, are still affecting our communities today. We have a responsibility 
working together to fix them once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kern? Thanks. I think every county in Nassau is affected by these empty houses. They attract rodents, they attract sometimes squatters, you've all seen the weeds, and there's only so much that the municipalities can do to, 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 to do this, to, to deal with it. Um, I was very proud to have been able to spearhead legislation to start a Nassau County land bank, and I actually sit on the board of this land bank. So we're started, we got our first grant, we're working on our first closing, and the, the whole purpose of a land bank is it's a, it's, it's a quasi-governmental entity where you take, it starts with grant money. You take grant money, you buy property. This is, we're working on one empty and abandoned place. Um, I can't tell you where it is because the deal's not done yet. And what happens is you invest with that grant money, you redo it, and then you sell it. And then the money that you get from that sale goes into the bank. And then the more you do, the more you can do. And actually, my assistant went to, a, when I first became a legislator, she went to a conference where she heard about this. And I got very excited. I'm like, oh, we've got to do something about this. So uh, this is start, it's starting slow, but we're making progress and it gives me a lot of hope. Land trust is a slightly different thing. With a land bank, we take them and then we sell them very quickly. With a land trust, the land trust holds on to it, holds on to the land. It's slightly different, but we can definitely work together, the land banks and the land trust. Uh, it's, I, I, we, the way we, we did it in the legislature, it has an affordable component. So we want to make sure that these homes are affordable for all the reasons we've been talking about why it's so important to have affordable housing here in Nassau. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Martins, uh, this one starts with you. Uh, the logical outflow of that conversation, that question is, what would you do to assist our homeless population? You know, it is... Um it's a, a, frankly, a disgrace for any of us to understand that there are people out there who are homeless in a county as affluent with all of the resources that we have in Nassau County. Um, the current administration said that we do not have any homeless veterans in Nassau County. And I would tell you that um, nothing is further from the truth. Uh, they're out there. We know they're out there. And unless we acknowledge that they're there and we can't, we can't pretend that we do not have a homeless problem in Nassau County. Um, we have the resources to do it, certainly, through our hospital, through our um, social services programs, and, and frankly, through uh, working with our veterans associations, we have a responsibility to go out there and tackle these issues head on. As we head into the winter, you see it more and more often. You see the impacts. We live in an area that gets extraordinarily cold in the winter. And yet, when you go to most downtowns or many downtowns, you see the effects firsthand. So we have to empower our law enforcement to be able to move them into shelters. They're there. We have to make sure that our veteran services continue to provide access to um, programs and connect many veterans to benefits that they already have. They serve their country. They have access to them. They may not be aware of them, and we have to make sure that they can. Um, but it starts with not closing our eyes to the issue and pretending it doesn't exist but being prepared to deal with it head on. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kern? You know, the county has a homeless outreach service, and they do be wonderful work. Unfortunately, it's just not staffed enough. Um, you know, where I live, you go to the train station and you see these people, and they don't have anywhere to go. As you know, it's not a crime to be homeless. So we, in the government, need to do a better job of connecting people to the services that will help them whether it's substance abuse services, mental health. Yes, the veterans, there are so many of our homeless are veterans, and there are benefits that they're entitled to that many don't even know. So I think we need real consistency in how we reach out to the homeless, how we reach out to the veterans, and give them the services that they need so that they're taken care of properly. Thank you. Ms. Lund? Well, we need to have more places for these people to actually go and be sheltered, especially in bad weather. Um, this is one of the most NIMBY places I've ever lived. Um, nobody wants homeless people living near them. When you say it's young homeless mothers with little children, that's okay. And when you say, oh, but it's veterans, that's okay. But when you say we're going to move 60 homeless families into this convent, as I read recently, um, no, I don't want that in my neighborhood. Um, we need to find places that are available and provide these people with housing, especially when the weather 
will kill them if they stay outside. I don't think empowering law enforcement to make people go into housing is a good idea. People have a right to be outside if they want to. Um, but we need to help these people and um, provide permanent housing solutions, not just shelters, work with them until we can move them into low cost housing, help them find programs, help them get, connect with what income they're entitled to from social services. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question would start with uh, Ms. Kern. Mm -hmm. And it is, what can you do to make Nassau County a better place to retire in and age in place? Hmm, excellent question. Again, we need a wider range of housing options. Uh, there's a, I have neighbors right across the street from me. They're grandparents now. They're looking to downsize. Down on the South Shore, they had a really hard time to find a place to live. You know, a lot of these, they're not quite ready for assisted living, but assisted living can be up to $9,000 a month. That is not affordable. So if we want to keep our families intact and keep our communities intact, we've got to do a better job of creating an environment that helps bring about a wider range of housing options. We also have an office to help seniors. Let's make sure, again, that we connect seniors with the services that they, that they need and that they expect and that will help them stay here. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lenz? Well, with the real estate taxes and the housing costs on this island, I don't know why anybody would stay here after they retire. I'm thinking of moving myself after I'm retirement age. It's, um, you know, it's so much cheaper to live somewhere else. But my friends and I are, are considering setting up a sort of commune somewhere, I don't know if it can be on Long Island because of the regulations, wherein we old folks each have our own room in a big old house and we hire our own staff to look out for us so that we hire and fire and they're not gonna abuse us. They help us as much as we need and, uh, and they leave us alone to do what we wanna do if we don't need their help. I mean, that's my own personal innovative solution, and I think it can be done on a larger scale if we encourage people to do that while they're still young enough to actually carry out these plans. They're not so infirm that they have nothing to do uh, or they can't, uh, they can't do these things. Um, realistically, uh, we can... If P I don't think everybody's, that's not for everybody. What we can do is try to lower taxes, lower real estate taxes so that people can afford to stay in their homes and can afford to uh, stay where they are and have transportation, someone to pick them up, the, uh, the, the program that picks up senior citizens and takes them where they need to go is working well, I think. Thank you. Mr. Martins? Thank you. Um, first, I would suggest inviting your friends to and your neighbors to come to Mineola because we do have housing stock there for for seniors and we built affordable senior housing as part of our downtown redevelopment it does come with making a commitment not just talking about it going out there and making the commitment to doing it in our downtowns and there are certainly great communities that are more than willing to do it if anyone's in um, understands or is familiar with project independence a great program that they have in North Hempstead um, that the, the town government in North Hempstead has implemented um, to allow seniors to age in place. Seniors who made our community, seniors that were the bedrock of our communities and essentially made everything what it is today. We live there because they made it possible. They shouldn't have to make a decision as to whether or not to leave their communities and so making it more affordable to, for them to get medical care access to treatment, access to transportation, all of these issues that they're doing so well. And one of the clearest forms of flattery is plagiarism. Um, and it's okay for you to do that in government. If you see best practices, we should take that. And certainly taking a great program that they have and that Judy Bosworth is doing up in North Hempstead and incrementally bringing that into programs in, in Nassau County certainly makes sense. But it means housing, it means independent living, it also means, by the way, the opportunity that should exist for us to provide time out. Thank you. <laughs> Keep remembering what you didn't finish and oh, at the I end, will. it'll will. go into the conclusion. 
Okay, uh, next question starts with Mrs. Uh, Ms. Lems. Um, I, I, my family came out here in the 50s, and although I moved out many years ago, um, I'm amazed at the diversity in Nassau County these days, and not suddenly, but as, as it's just morphed into a, a tremendous variety. One of the questions from the audience is, what did each of you learn from the violence in Charlottesville, Virginia? And how would you work to prevent hate crimes and the spread of hate groups here in Nassau County? Ms. Oh, Lenz. I, what I learned from Charlottesville was there are really horrible people out there. I did not realize just how horrible people could be. Um, I'm forgetting the rest of the question. Um, what I would, I think education is the key to um, preventing the sort of thing we saw in Charlottesville. I've seen uh, postings online where people have made it a point to befriend people of another race or people of another faith and make it an actual personal connection and that's made a difference in how both parties thought about the other. I think we need to integrate our communities some more so that people are exposed to the other cultures. Um, it's easy to hate somebody if you've never really met one of them. Uh, it's a lot harder to hate someone whose hand you've sh shaken and uh, who's you've eaten a meal with. Um, and I, it probably starts in the schools. We need, to, we need to introduce the cultures to each other and make sure that we see each other as human beings. Okay, thank you. Mr. Martins? I agree. You know, um, there is no place for hate in our society, and we certainly, as um, leaders, to be truly leaders, we need to actually go out there and denounce it everywhere we see it. You know, some people would say they're exercising their First Amendment rights. I don't believe that there's a First Amendment right to hate. And certainly, we need to be constantly vigilant, but also understand that, unfortunately, we live in an ever-polarized and more polarized society where people get their news from silos. They listen to people who merely echo their own beliefs and reinforce them and are rarely open to other ideas. And you see it. Here in Nassau County as well, you see it everywhere. And if people would just stop for a moment and realize that we all want the same thing, all of us, regardless of where we stand on the political spectrum, we want opportunities for ourselves and for our children. We want to be safe in our homes. We want to have the opportunity to express ourselves independently. And so let's start listening a little more to each other. And I think that goes a long way. So what do we do as a society? Um, we fight it everywhere we see it. We make sure that we don't put them, if they are going to be out there expressing themselves and there is a First Amendment right for them to do so, uh, we make sure that they're not going to be in a place where they're going to enter into conflicts with others. Um, we denounce it first and foremost, and whether it's bigotry, whether it's bigotry based on ethnicity, race, or, or religion, um, we have to make sure that there is no place for it here in Nassau County. Thank you. Ms. Kern? We are becoming more diverse here in Nassau County, and really, I think it's a source of strength for us. And I would encourage, you know, we're lucky when, because we're campaigning. I get to visit mosques. I get to visit all kinds of churches. I get to visit our Orthodox Jewish communities. And I find it just is, I would encourage everyone to go to a house of worship that you know nothing about or know very little about or you have a, you know, some fixed idea in your mind. Because I'm telling you, you, it will blow your mind. You will meet people, you will meet, it's, it just enriches, enriches your experience, it enriches our county, it, I think it enriches our economy. And the more that we can encourage this, I think the better off we'll all be. So from a government point of view, what can we do? I think, you know, we have to make sure that our police are on top of things when the, obviously people are allowed to protest, they're allowed to demonstrate. Let's make sure that it's done in a safe way and that the vo kind of violence that we saw in Charlottesville doesn't happen here. You know, unfortunately, I think some of the rhetoric coming from some of our national leaders, 
might give people the feeling that it's okay to do this, but it's really not. And here on the local level, we really have to make the stand to say, our diversity is our strength, we should celebrate it, and we should encourage it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Mr. Martins. Uh, in light of the recent natural disasters that have affected American citizens, what's your plan to safeguard Nassau County? Well, um, I believe in global warming. I believe that we need to take global warming into consideration as part of um, our planning. Um, I voted for legislation in Albany that would allow us to do that and require us to do that. Anyone who thinks that the idea that we have 500-year storms every year is the new normal and it's okay without understanding that we have to prepare for these events and that there are ways of us being able to combat them, unfortunately, is living in an alternate universe. We are now subject to some of the worst storms that we've seen in the history of our uh, frankly, of our society, and we have a responsibility to take those into consideration. So when we rebuild, we rebuild understanding that there are going to be impacts. When we plan, whether it's infrastructure or otherwise, we have the opportunity to build to a certain standard, taking into consideration. South Shore, the opportunity for a hurricane to hit Long Island much the same way Superstorm Sandy did, and the devastation that that would impact not only those coastal communities, but our entire infrastructure on Long Island, is critically important that we take the steps to protect our communities and the infrastructure going forward. Bob Kennedy in, uh, in Freeport has this. And we'll hear that Thank later, Thank you. We'll hear too. about Bob in a while. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kern? Yes, I can finish that if you'd like. Sure, thank he, you. I, not to put words in your mouth, but you can tell me if I'm, this is not where you were going. Uh, the mayor of Freeport has suggested doing these floodgates to, so when there's a storm surge about to come, the floodgates come up and stop the surge. Is that accurate? Good. Um, <laughs> so, that said taxpayer-funded infrastructure has to take into account climate change. So he got rid of that rule, saying no longer does taxpayer-funded infrastructure have to take into account rising change. Thank you. Ms. Lenz? I agree with everything Laura has just said, everything. And I'd like to add that we in Nassau County have a program called the Community Emergency Response Team. Every citizen is eligible to take the training. I've taken the training and or when a tornado hits. Um, it is a wonderful program, it's free. Well, it's not free, taxpayers pay for it, but. Uh, or when, it, when any kind of catastrophe hits. Um, there, that was my advertisement for CERT. Um, and yes, we do need to abide by the terms of the Paris Accord, regardless of what our national government does. Nassau County is in a, a position to just adopt it and, and go forward with it and just ignore what 46 is doing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, just a word to the audience. Uh, we have just over 20 minutes left until we must stop. Uh, there has been an undercurrent of muttering and comments, and I've tried to ignore it. However, I will not, so we can have a few more questions. If you cannot stop muttering, please leave the room. It's distracting to everyone. Okay. Um, Ms. Kern, starting with you here, uh, just to follow up on that. Um, water has become a geopolitical issue worldwide. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the availability of quality water, no one entity seems to have the responsibility and power to act when necessary. How can this be corrected in Nassau County? There's, there's an excellent question. So it's a real, we live in a crazy patchwork quilt of all kinds of entities, municipalities, districts, etc. We all know that. And it's no different when it comes to water. We have a village, the village of Freeport, the district that I represent. right now to see what the consequences of this will be and I'm concerned there could be two very dire consequences the first is that the water when it's sucked out of those is about 60 more than 60 million gallons per day could come out of those wells it will it will cause the two plumes the Grumman plume the big one and the smaller one in Lake Success to spread or shift directions and uh, of course the the other concern is that salt water because of that sucking motion could has could cause salt water to intrude and make our water undrinkable so we've got to fight against this plan in the city against Bill de Blasio's plan to perhaps reopen these wells I think they're concerned about flooding in basements in Queens you know I think the consequences for us will be much worse than a little flooding in some basements Thank you. Ms. Limes? We need to get officials from all of the different government entities that control water in this area together and on board with a big plan. Um, Um, I'd like to at least see a study done on that um, because the Grumman plume really is concerning. Um, I think reuse of water and recharging in that area in particular would be very helpful at pushing the chemicals back down. Um, we can also study using water rather than just pumping it out full of nitrogen into the oceans, use it to water lawns, golf courses, parklands, things like that, so that that water is not drawn from our drinking supply. It's already full of nitrogen. We might as well put it back on the lawns. Thank you. Hmm. Mr. Martin? Thank you. Um, I ran a water department when I was mayor of Mineola for eight years. I understand how the water system works. When I was in Albany, I worked with Assemblywoman Schimmel across the aisle uh, to secure the $6 million that Laura spoke of that finally called for a study. You know, if you understand the miracle that is our sole source aquifer, this, this bubble of fresh water surrounded by salt water, and yet no one in Nassau or Suffolk County had bothered to determine where the salt water is.
problems. This one starts with you. Uh, in the introductory statements, as well in, in much of the media, there's been a lot said about corruption and concerns. I'm going to give you three terms, and if you can knit them into your response so we can cover this. One is um, an independent inspector general. The next term is um, pay to play. And the third is publicly funded campaigns. You're stealing my closing statement. <laughs> wow. We need election reform. Um, public? Okay. Um, I favor a system of full public campaign financing where candidates who agree not to accept private money are given equal grants of public money. Part of the reason that the government is corrupt is that politicians from the two parties accept large contributions from corporations and contractors. Do you think these two are going to forget who gave them all that money once they're in office? Well, we Green Party candidates do not accept any contrib contributions from corporations or special interests. This guarantees that once in office, I will not be tempted to vote in favor of some corporation or contractor over the best interest of the residents of Nassau County. No more pay to play. Our party forbids its officers from accepting patronage jobs, so I have no political favors to repay. I will simply appoint the most qualified people to help run the government. Have I worked in all of, oh, independent spec, inspector general. Why don't we have one? I don't understand it. We need one. <laughs> What's the holdup? Um, I think I have covered all of the terms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin. Thank you. I, I think we need legitimate, robust ethics reforms in Nassau County. We have, um, unfortunately, in Nassau County, and I do not come from Nassau County government, but we, do, we have paid lip service in Nassau County to the idea of ethics reform for far too long. So the idea of having an ethics board but no staff or dedicated funding stream. The idea of having a commissioner of investigations that has subpoena power and has the ability to do and review all of the things that um, people have talked about an inspector general doing, and frankly, if you want to call it the commissioner of investigations, which is a title that already exists, if you want to call it something else, call it whatever you want. But the idea of creating another layer of government simply because you want to make political hay out of it then let's use our committee, commissioner of investigations to do exactly that. That's why they're in the county charter right now. This concept of ethics reform that allows for oversight, procurement reform, the ability to tie disclosure statements to that, the procurement records so the people who are doing business with the county do not have alternative um, uh, relationships with elected officials or policymakers elected officials who are working for companies that do business with the county, that's got to stop. The, there has to be zero tolerance in this county when it comes to the impression of impropriety. Not only the appearance of impropriety, not only the bad things that are happening that people are getting caught for, but the things that have gone wrong for too long. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Curran? So my, oppo my opponent to this side just talked about zero tolerance for corruption. However, when he had the opportunity to deal with a, a, an alleged corrupt official, Dean Skelos, his mentor, he did nothing. Nice in fact, job. he did everything he could to keep him in power, including writing a, <laughs> signing a letter. All right, time. Uh, um, no. Gentlemen. Thanks including to you, signing a we're going to end up cutting off questions. In including signing a letter to keep him in power, going to a fundraiser for him, and blocking a motion on the Senate floor to remove Dean Skelos from power. So he had the opportunity to actually do it, and he didn't. And all of these things happened within that first week after Dean Skelos was arrested. Also, I don't know if his plan is credible in combating corruption because he doesn't address contracting and he doesn't address patronage. In my plan, I've rolled out very concrete ways. Yes, I do believe we need an independent inspector general, whether it's called commissioner of investigations or what. We do need that, 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 that independent entity doing that. 
Um, we also need to make sure that every contract is online and is online in a very readable way, that all unsolicited proposals are also put online, which could have prevented the Abtech scandal from happening in the first place. We need a doing business with list. Yes, I am accepting donations to be competitive in this race, but if elected county executive, we will severely limit the amount that people can donate who do business with the county. Also, we need to make sure that we hire based on what you know, not who you know. And Thank I'll you. talk about that later. Is that a red card? Yes. Okay. Of course. 30 Thank seconds. You. Yes. I appreciate it. And um, you each have three left, so if you want to go back and forth. Well, I appreciate you encouraging cards. that, but I'll take my 30 <laughs> seconds right now. Thank you. You know, um, there's only one person at this table um, who called on the county executive to step down the moment he was indicted, even though um, we have Legislator Denenberg, legis Legislator Solages, Democrats who have uh, violated the public trust to go back and talk about pay to play in the context of a majority leader who was removed from office one week from the day he was indicted and yet be sitting here basing an entire campaign or running for county executive on someone who was indicted and you never called on him to step down. It's a shame. 30 seconds. So calling on Ed Mangano to resign when you're running for Congress is all very well, but it just, it just you know, how do you pick? You pick this one's okay, this one's not. Um, yes, it is a problem on both sides of the aisle. We do have a culture of corruption. The system is absolutely broken. I'm not a career politician. I'm not from part of this machine. That's why I'm running from county executive, because I want to give Nassau County the fresh start that it sorely deserves. And I don't think you're going to get it from the same old players playing with the same old playbook. Mr. Thank Martins. You, you know, um, it's wonderful to say I'm not a, a, a career politician and to use that term. And, and it's great because, thankfully, aside from my public office, I've never worked for government um, for my elected office. But, you know, I, I noticed that you talk about patronage, but you spent two years as an appointee of Tom Swasey in the county as a patronage appointee, and yet you don't put it on your bio, you don't include it, you talk about transparency, and you've never told anyone in Nassau County that you were a person who benefited from patronage, and you say, I'll do it when I'm elected county executive. Either you have the courage of your convictions or you do not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You each get 10 minutes for the wrap. Everything you want to remind everyone of? I'm 10, 10? minutes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. In your dreams, <laughs> it's 10. Yeah, right? In my dream. <laughs> I'd love to give you 10 minutes. <laughs> my apologies. It's two minutes. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> but uh, we're going in uh, reverse order. So Ms. Lenz, Ms. Curran, Mr. Martins. Two minutes. Well, I think I've prevented, presented some new ideas here today. Um, if you elect me, you will see some big changes in this government. As your county executive, I will work to bring greater accountability to county government, to fight the privatization of public utilities and vital <laughs> services such as drinking water, sewage, and transportation, to restructure the way in, the w in which the county collects income by greatly reducing property taxes and instituting a graduated county income tax that will be fairer to people at all income levels. The rich will pay more, the poor will pay less. And to lobby for the New York health care bill, which would save Nassau County government half a billion dollars in health care benefits and greatly improve county finances like that. And of course, to safeguard our, our environment, our earth, the only planet we have. And I will, I will vow, I will bring about positive change to Nassau County. Thank you. Ms. Curran, two minutes. Thanks to the League. Thanks to all of you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. You could be somewhere else on this beautiful fall day. And uh, I, I think we should have Cassandra in all of our forums. I like, I like having you here. <laughs> Um, so I, I moved to Nassau County, we closed, my husband and I, before we had kids, we closed on our house 20 years ago this month. 
Um, we came here for the Long Island Dream. Single family house, there's a really great elementary school around the corner from us, parks, beaches. And of course we knew we would be paying high taxes, but it was part of a deal that we were willing to make. But as a county legislator, and as a taxpayer, uh, for the pa as a county legislator for the past four years, I've been very frustrated. I am tired of watching the seeming endless corruption, the shameless patronage, and the contracting that doles out sweetheart deals. And you see, I won't go through the whole litany, but yes, there are people on both sides that are arrested and indicted on corruption and other charges. And when that happens, I'm offended. I'm offended for my neighbors. I'm offended because, you know, it's us and our neighbors who are the true victims of this corruption who are the true victims of this dishonesty. And it's our money that's stolen when Dean Skelos' son gets a sweetheart deal. It's our money that's stolen when people are hired based on who they know and not what they know. And so I'm running for county executive because I want to end this culture of corruption. I'm running because I want to give Nassau County the fresh start it desperately deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Curran. Mr. Martins? Thank you. Thank you to the League. Uh, thank you to both Cassandra and Laura um, for our discussion here, and thank you all for taking time out of your day on a Sunday afternoon to join us. You know, this is rather straightforward. Um, no one here on this dais is corrupt. No one here on this dais is um, and should be um, under suspicion. None of us. We're all raising our families here in Nassau County. We're all homeowners. We're all trying to do the best we can. Some of us have more experience than others, but I don't think anyone should question the, um, the good intentions that are here as well. But the challenges we have come January 1st for whomever gets elected are significant. It's not about the current administration. It's not about a past administration. It's about the challenges that we are facing come January 1st, the financial challenges, the issues with assessment, economic development, job creation, dealing with the environment, dealing with those issues that are so important to each and every one of us, it's why we live here. And so whomever it is has to have the ability and the skill sets not only to deal with issues across the aisle, which I have been able to do during my tenures, not only in the Senate, but also in Mineola, building consensus and showing leadership, but tackling these issues head on because it's not just about talking about them. It's not just about dealing with them in the midst of a campaign. It's about making sure that you have the skill set and the ability to actually have the courage of your convictions. And so, for the future, because I do believe that count the county's years, the best years are still ahead of it, we need to work together. Whoever wins comes January, we have to work together Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and Green. Yes, we all have to work together to make sure that the next hundred years are the best yet. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, my thanks to the candidates for uh, some wonderful comments and insights. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover all of them. We would really have loved to. There were great questions Same out time there. Next week. Yeah. Same time <laughs> next week, yes. And thank you all, um, and be sure to vote and turn that ballot over on Election Day. Thank you.